Lean in here. Tell me what you think about this. There is no limit to what we can become. There is no limit to what we can do when we know, when we really know that we're loved. Jackie Lantry tells a story of adopting a boy out of horrific conditions in China. She tells the story better than I do, so I'm going to let her tell the story. She says, we adopted Luke four years ago. The people from the orphanage dropped him off at our hotel room without even saying goodbye. He was nearly six years old, only 28 pounds, and his face was crisscrossed with scars. Clearly, he was terrified. What are his favorite things? I yelled. Noodles, they replied as the elevator door shut. Luke kicked and screamed. I stood between him and the door to keep him from bolting. His cries were anguished, animal-like. He had never seen a mirror and tried to escape by running through one. I wound my arms around him so he could not hit or kick. After an hour and a half, he finally fell asleep, exhausted. I called room service. They delivered every noodle dish on the menu. Luke woke up, looked at me, and started sobbing again. I handed him chopsticks and pointed at the food. He stopped crying and started to eat. He ate until I was sure he would be sick. That night we went for a walk. Delighted at the moon, he pantomimed to me. What is it? I said, the moon. It's the moon. He reached up and tried to touch it. He cried again when I tried to give him a bath until I started to play with the water. By the end of his bath, the room was soaked and he was giggling. I lotioned him up, powdered him down, and clothed him in some soft PJs. We read the book, One Yellow Lion. He loved looking at the colorful pictures and turning the pages. By the end of the night, he was saying, One Yellow Lion. The next day, we met orphanage officials to do paperwork. Luke was on my lap as they filed into the room. He looked at them and wrapped my arms tightly around his waist. He was a sad, shy boy for a long time after those first days. He cried easily and withdrew at the slightest provocation. He hid food in his pillowcase and rummaged through the trash cans. I wondered then if he would ever get over the wounds of neglect that the orphanage had beaten into him. It's been four years. Luke is a smart, funny, happy fourth grader. He is loaded with charm and is a natural athlete. His teachers say he's well-behaved and works very hard. Our neighbor says she's never seen a happier kid. When I think back, I'm amazed at what transformed this abused, terrified little creature. It was not therapy, counselors, or medication. It did not cost money, require connections, or great privilege. It was love. Just simple, plain, easy to give. Love is primal. It is comprised of compassion, care, security, and a leap of faith. There is no limit to what we can become. There's no limit to what we can accomplish when we know, really know, that we're loved. We're five weeks into our summer series through the book of Ephesians, and I have had a great time. I hope you have too. If you've been here every week through the series, you have gotten your gospel fix. Every week through the book of Ephesians, we have just seen incredible news about who God is, about what he has done for us through Christ, about who we are as a result. We have seen that Paul wrote this uh, letter to first century Christians to remind them of the spiritual realities of the gospel, that they were blessed and chosen and adopted and predestined before the foundation of the world, that they're saved by grace through faith, that they are spirit-filled and so much more. But this church that he's writing to, they were in danger of losing their identity. They were in danger of kind of sliding back into the identity that they had before they had come to faith in Christ. And so Paul is writing this great treatise on the gospel to remind them to become who you are, to lean into your true identity in Christ. And today we come to the end of chapter 3, and really we come to the end of the first section of two sections in the book of Ephesians, because Ephesians is really a book, is broken into two parts. It's six chapters. You have one through three, and four through six are the two parts. And one through three are really the parts of the, of the, the letter that give us the theological foundation about who we are, the gospel, what, what God has done for us, who he is, who we are as a result of what he has done for us. Paul is setting this firm foundation because in chapter 4, 5, and 6, he's going to get into some very practical information about what it looks like to live as a redeemed, 
adopted child of God. He's going to give very specific instruction about how we should live and how we should interact with one another, even how we should talk. But before he gets to the second section, he wants to make sure we have a firm foundation in the gospel and the reality of who we are. He wants us to have the proper motives for knowing why we live the way we do. That we don't do these things in order to please God, but because of who we are in Christ already. And so today we come to the end of this first section, chapters 1 through 3. And Paul's going to get one last word in, in this theological, beautiful foundation he's setting. And it's going to be a prayer. It's going to be the second prayer we come to in this letter so far. And in this prayer, we're going to see very clearly the one thing Paul wants to say, the last word he wants to say before he launches into the the practical how-to-live part. And that is, we need to be rooted and established in love. Because Paul realizes that there is nothing we can't do, there is nothing we can't become when we know we are loved. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 through 21. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, I would encourage you to turn there now. Find that in your Bible. I'm going to just read through this this prayer. I'm going to read through the entire thing. And then we can kind of come back and kind of go verse by verse and, and look at what Paul is saying as we unpack it. But here again, we're coming to this last section, and Paul is just kind of ending it with this beautiful prayer and doxology to God. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 says, or excuse me, uh, is that a 14? I think that's 14, yeah. For this reason, he says, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through the Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. What a beautiful ending to this first half of of the letter. Paul begins in verse 14. He says, For this reason I kneel before the Father and pray. Well, for what reason, Paul? What is the the reason that is leading you to kneel before the Father and pray. Well, for everything he's been talking about in in, in chapters 1 through 3, for the gospel, the truth of the gospel, for the fact that we are adopted and redeemed and predestined before the foundation of the world because we are saved by grace, because the wall has been torn down between us and God and between Jew and Gentile, we've all been called together in Christ. Paul is saying, for this reason, I am motivated to kneel before the Father and pray. And I just love this imagery of this great man of God, the Apostle Paul, kneeling before the Father and praying for the Ephesian believers that he loves so deeply. You know, Paul mentions his posture in prayer. He says he kneels before the Father. You know, I believe that posture and body language is important in any communication. I am told, those that are close to me, that um, I say more with my face than I typically do with my words, that um, you could tell what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling before I ever say a word. It's just it's right there. I'm kind of transparent like that. It's, it's been good for me at times, and it's also gotten me in a lot of trouble. But, but body language and posture can communicate so much, and the same is true in prayer. What posture we take in prayer in many ways will communicate what is going on in our hearts or what we think about or how we are feeling about God. Certainly, now, there, there, there will be times when we're praying that we can't, like, assume a particular posture. When we're in a meeting and we're just, like, shooting up that quick prayer, we're driving and we're, we're praying or we're out for a prayer walk, you know, maybe we can't assume the right prayer. But there are times when we have to ask ourselves, what posture could I take that would communicate to God what I'm feeling right now, what I'm going through, what I'm thinking about Him? You know, uh, oftentimes I like to pray with an upturned face. You know, the upturned face is someone who's just basking in the presence of God. Expectancy, waiting, hopeful. God, I trust you. You're good. I'm toward you. Someone with upturned hands in prayer is someone who's also expectant, waiting for God 
to provide. Someone who has a head bowed in prayer maybe is someone who is feeling contrite or humble. Someone who is kneeling in prayer, the way Paul is kneeling during this prayer. They're honoring God and respecting God and revering God. They're, Paul is kneeling before God like a servant before a master saying, I am yours. When we bury our face in the floor on our faces, it is like, I am all yours, God. It is a posture of worship. Our posture matters in prayer. It communicates perhaps even more than our words do. But Paul kneels before the Father and he prays. And already, uh, as we pointed out in this letter, this is the second prayer that we come to. Paul is a great man of prayer. Um, And this prayer in particular is a passionate, powerful prayer that is, again, very clear. In verse 16, Paul prays that the Ephesian believers might be filled with spiritual power. I pray that you may be filled with the power of the Spirit. Why? He says, so that you may be filled with the presence of God. Christ, so that Jesus may dwell in your hearts through faith. The result of spiritual power that Paul prays for us is so that Christ can dwell more and more in our hearts. And I believe this really shows the progressive nature of Christ's indwelling in our lives. We think oftentimes it's like a switch we turn on and off. Either Jesus is indwelling me or he's not. But it's really a progressive indwelling that the more I trust him, the more I surrender to him, the different aspects and parts of my life, the more he dwells within us, the more spiritual intimacy we experience with the Father, the more spiritual power we experience with in our lives. This is Paul's prayer for his spiritual children, that you would have spiritual power so that Christ can dwell in your hearts. Then in verse 17 through 19, he gets to the, really the heart of his prayer, and he comes to the essence of what he believes we need if we're going to become who we are. Verse 17 through 19, I'll put this up on the screen so we can just kind of pick it apart a little bit. He says, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So Paul's prayer for us is that we would be rooted and established in love. What is the most important thing for us to live into our identity, to to become who we are, to live as sons and daughters of God. What do we need more than anything? Love. We need to know more than anything we are loved by God. We need to be secure in the love of God. We need to be rooted and established in the love of God. And I love these two words, rooted and established. He's using two different metaphors from the world in which he lived. And the word rooted that he used is a word from the agricultural world. It's a word that gives us kind of an imagery of a tree that is planted with roots that sink down deep into the soil so that when drought comes, that tree survives. When winds and storms blow, that tree continues to to thrive because it is well-rooted in the soil. And what Paul is telling us is that as we are rooted and sink down roots deep into the love of God, the love of God being the soil in which we are rooted, we too form the kind of connection with him, the kind of character, the kind of uh, intimacy that can withstand spiritual drought, that can withstand the storms of life, that as we put down our roots into the love of God, the love of God give us the nutrients that we need to become spiritually mature and bear spiritual fruit. This is the kind of thing Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. In in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, a good tree will bear good fruit. And here Paul is telling us a, a good tree is one that has its roots in the love of God, that as we sink down our roots in the love of God, we get the nutrients we need to bear that good fruit. Jesus spoke of some of the best fruit that there is, and that is love for God and love for people. Right? And so that as I'm rooted in the love of God, I begin to bear fruit in my life that I love God more and more, that I'm more patient and loving and gentle and forgiving and tolerant and loving with the people around me. I serve better. I become a servant of men just as Jesus was. But the opposite is also true. If this fruit isn't being produced in ever greater kind of quantities in our lives, it may mean that I am not rooted in the love of God, but maybe I'm serving or following for some other reason. But we need to be secure, rooted well in the love of God. Then he talks about being established, as the other, other translations translate it, to be grounded 
in the love of God. And this isn't from the agricultural wor- world, but this is a word from architectural world. And it gives a sense of a building that is built on a strong foundation, built down into the bedrock. So that, again, when floods come or when an earthquake happens, that building is not shaken because it is well established. It is rooted in the bedrock. And again, this is something that Jesus spoke of in the Sermon on the Mount when he talked about building our house on the rock. That if we build our house on the rock, that we can withstand when the floods come and the storms come. And Paul is saying the same thing. If we are built on the foundation of God's love, if we are established on that foundation of God's love, then when the storms of life come and the, and the earthquakes and the storms and the floods, then we are going to be able to withstand that. Because uh, we're not building our foundation on our feelings. We're not building our foundation on the circumstances of our life, viewing God's love through those lenses. No, no, no. We see God's love as steady, constant, never changing, undergirding everything in my life. According to Paul, it's all about love. Knowing we are radically, unconditionally loved. If I want to bear fruit in my life, if I want to be able to withstand When storms blow, if I want to persevere when things get difficult in my life, I need to be rooted and established in love. There is no limit to what we can accomplish, no limit to what we can become when we know we are loved. But what is love? How do you define it? How would you explain it? Um, You know, It's a subject of probably nearly every song ever written, every story ever told. But we still wonder, what is it? What what, what is love? Did you know in 2016, Google, the number one question asked on Google was, what is love? We want to know. What is it? And at the risk of, of, of stating the obvious, God's love is different from human love. Right? As a matter of fact, God's love is different from anything we have ever experienced on this planet. I mean, grandparents kind of come close. But God's love is different from human love. And so, uh, based on what is revealed to us through Scripture, let me share with you just a few of the characteristics of the love of God so we could maybe start to try and wrap our minds around God's love for us. And first of all, God's love is immeasurable. It is beyond measure. You can't measure it. Paul prays that we might know how wide and long and high and deep God's love is. And and these dimensions that he's giving us, these, these measurements that he's giving us are meant to emphasize the immensity of God's love. What he's saying is you can go to the left or the right as far as you can. You can go forward. You can go backward as far as you can. You can go up or you can go down as far as you want. But you will not come to the limits of understanding or grasping the love of God, because it is beyond measure. One of my favorite hymns ever written was by Frederick Lehman in 1917. He wrote a hymn called The Love of God. We've sung it here before. Beautiful song. And the third verse in particular, every time I sing it, every time I hear it, just moves me. The metaphor that is used. And Lehman actually didn't even write it. He found it. And people have tried to trace where it came from. And it's actually been traced back to a man who lived in the 11th century, a follower of God in the 11th century. But this is what it says. Maybe you know it. But the the third verse says, Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the sky of parchment made, if every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade. So he's saying, okay, just imagine this. Imagine filling the ocean with ink, and imagine that all the skies of the world are made of paper. Imagine every stick on the planet is a pen, and every person on the planet has been assigned the task of becoming a writer. Imagine that. To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. What a beautiful metaphor. What a beautiful picture to illustrate the immeasurable nature of the love of God. It is so big, we can't wrap our minds around it. Not only is it immeasurable, but it is also unconditional. You can't earn it. You can't merit it. As a matter of fact, it has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with me. It has all, everything to do with him. I was recently reading... Um, great reformer Martin Luther, I came across this quote. It's just, wow, 
he contrasts the love of God to human love. Just check out this quote and, and, and let's see what it means. He says, the love of man comes into being through that which is pleasing to it. The love of God does not find but creates that which is pleasing to it. So what he's saying that, that for us, we encounter something that pleases us or moves us and that elicits love. We, we come across something lovable, you know, a, a beautiful work of art, or we eat a delicious meal, or we hold a newborn baby in our arms, and love is created in us. Basically, we love those things that are lovable, that move us to love. But Luther rightly points out that God's love is very different. He says that objects don't elicit God's love by their qualities or by their characteristics. Rather, God creates objects together with their qualities that he loves. It means that if God created you, he loves you. Because he only creates things that he loves. God's love is unconditional. It has nothing to do with you, the object. It has everything to do with the lover. It's also, it's not only immeasurable, it's not only unconditional, it is also universal. That means that his arms reach wide enough to embrace every person on the planet, everywhere, regardless of who we are, regardless of what we have done. If you have breath in your lungs, God loves you. You are the object of his love. He loves you radically. There's no measure to how much he loves you. Jesus famously said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, 16, For God so loves the world. It is universal. Or Paul put it even more powerfully as he wrote to the Christians in Rome where he said, I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principality nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is universal. Therefore, nothing can separate you from the love of God. More than that, it is forgiving of every person and every deed. Perhaps one of the greatest pictures of God's love of forgiveness is found in Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son. This son um, just wishes his father was dead, takes his inheritance early, just totally embarrasses and discredits his father's good name by taking the inheritance early, goes off, squanders the inheritance, all of his father's wealth. When he finds himself destitute and hungry, he finally comes to his senses, says, I'm going to go back to dad's ranch. I'm going to be a, a servant on his farm. But as the father sees his son coming, all he could see is his son is come home. And he runs out to him and he embraces him, puts a ring on his finger and puts a cloak around him. And he reinstates his son to the full status of sonship. And what this tells us is that God, our Father, is for us. His love is always for us, regardless of who we are or what we've done. He forgives us no matter what. Every person, every deed. God's love reaches that low to all of us. And finally, God's love has the goal of creating love in us. Now, let's be clear. Paul's prayer is not that we would love God more. That would be appropriate, and we certainly should. And Paul's prayer is not that we would love one another better, although that would be appropriate too. We should certainly do that. But Paul's prayer is very clearly that we would understand how loved we are. But the outcome of that is transformative. Again, when we understand that we are loved, there's nothing that we can't become, nothing that we can't do. Paul understands this, and Jesus understood this. John understood this, that when we understand that we are immeasurably, unconditionally, universally loved by a graceful, forgiving, tolerant, patient God, it changes us. It produces love in us. John, the apostle, put it so clearly in 1 John. We love because he first loved us. He loved us, therefore... We love him too. When we realize a God would love us that much, how could we not love him back? And when we realize he loves everyone else around me, it moves me to love as well. This has certainly been the case in my life. I had been a follower of Jesus for about two years. I was uh, in my early or mid-20s, very active in my church, just falling in love with the Bible and God. I was working as a stockbroker. And it was one Saturday night, after Kim and our six-month-old son had gone to bed, and I was up late, I was reading a book by Ellen White, and I came across this, this revelation of, of the heart of God 
It just totally blew my mind and blew my heart wide open. And, and, and a part of my heart, a part of my life that had previously been controlled by fear was now filled with the love of God. And it changed everything. It changed the total trajectory of my life. When I realized that instead of fear, that God's love for me was so high and so wide and so long and so deep, I fell to my knees in in, in just joyful gratitude and with tears in my eyes, I just thank God for such immeasurable love. And, And again, that changed the course of my life. It was that night that I felt God really calling me into uh, out of the financial world and into full-time ministry. And my point certainly isn't that when we find ourselves rooted and established in love that we should go into full-time pastoral ministry. But the point is that when we are rooted and established in love, it changes us. If there is no limit to what we can do or who we can become when we know that we're loved. It changes everything. It awakens love in us, love for God, love for people. That's what God wants for us. It's how we know we're rooted and established in love, that we love more. So Paul's prayer for us is not just that we know God's love, but rather that we grasp it. Love this verb, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. This verb in the original language is a very strong verb. You could just sense Paul just like looking for just the right word. What do I want them to do? I want them to, to grasp it. To In this context, it means to really deeply comprehend and, and to, to really perceive in a tangible way that leads to practical outcome. The height, the depth, the width, the, the length of God's love for us. But the question is, okay, I want to know I'm loved. I want to be rooted and established in love. But even Paul says he wants us to know this love that surpasses knowledge. It's like, it's like a paradox. Well, how do I do this? How do I know God's love? Let me just share a couple things in closing that I think can foster our awareness, our knowledge of God's love. And first, through our daily time with God. Now, if you're not spending time with God on a regular basis and you're wondering why you don't know God's love, that could be it right there. We've got to spend time creating space where God can kind of communicate to us his love for us. But when you do spend that time with him on a regular basis, what are you focused on when you come to him? Are you focused on you or are you focused on him? Are you focused on your sin and your brokenness and your troubles? Are you focused on his goodness, his mercy, his power? Let me encourage you, when, you, when you spend time with God, don't ignore your sin, don't throw it apart, side, but bring it to him with complete confidence in his mercy, in his forgiveness, in his love for you, knowing that he's the one who told you about it in the first place. You're just agreeing with him, and he wants to deal with it. And then just spend time just meditating on the fact that you are his beloved. You are loved beyond measure, unconditionally, universally. You know, one of Jesus' closest friends, John the Apostle, he called himself the Beloved. He said he called himself the one Jesus loved. Could you see calling yourself that on a regular basis, just going to God in prayer saying, Lord, here I am, your Beloved, the one you love. It's true. And there's, I mean, if a guy who wrote part of the Bible says it, then why couldn't we? But more than just our our private time, Paul gives us a hint as to how to come to know God's love in in a more practical way. He prays that we may have power together with the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. He's talking here about the church, the saints, those who have been saved by grace, those who have been called together in Christ to live their lives together in Christ. The saints are those who we are to be rooted and established in love together with. Now, at least, and what I believe Paul is saying here is that being rooted and established in love isn't something we can do completely on our own. We need one another for that. And there are at least two ways in which we need the church to grow in our comprehension of of Christ's great love. And first of all, we comprehend and come to uh, experience God's great love when we hear what God is doing for and in other people. I have not experienced 
the immeasurableness of God myself. None of us have. But as I hear how God is providing for you in your difficulty and how he is building your faith, how he's revealing himself to you, that is a revelation of God's love to me, and I begin to understand more fully, get a more complete picture of God's love in my life. So even if we could pile up all the stories of all the saints down through history, we'd still fall short of truly grasping the depth of God's love, but we'd be closer. And this is one of the great reasons to to be in community, to be in a small group, so that we can continually hear real-time stories of what God is doing in the lives of people just like us. We could certainly read the Bible, and we could get encouragement from how God blessed people living 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago. And there's merit to that. But there's nothing like hearing how God is ministering to and revealing his love to people around us real time. We need each other. Second reason that it requires all the saints to grow our comprehension of Christ's great love is that the expression of, the outworking of his love typically comes to us through other believers, through one another. We grow in love when when another believer demonstrates the love of God to us in a time of need. I had the privilege of being able to interact with one of our young people uh, in the church who was having some financial struggles recently, and the, the church decided we're just going you know, to help out, we're going to pay some bills. And just to be able to interact with this person who had tears in her eyes said, why are you doing this? And I said, this is just an expression of God's love for you, his grace for you. We're not doing this. This is how God feels about you. And just to see that revelation. Typically, this is how we experience the love of God. Is through one another. More than that, we need to experience God's love as we work through difficulties relationally with one another. That as we learn to uh, forgive and love and grow with one another, the point is that we need to be in close proximity to people in order to grow in patience and kindness and gentleness and forgiveness and to experience it as an expression of who God is. The brilliant John Stott said it so well. He says, it needs the whole people of God to understand the whole love of God. Do you know you are loved? Would you accept, just even if you don't feel it, would you accept by faith that God's love for you is wide and long and high and deep? Would you let it change how you view God, that picture that you have of him in your mind? Would you let it change your picture of you? Not as an unworthy nobody, but as an object of the love of the creator of the universe. Would it let you change how you live? Would you let it change what you worship? Would you let it change what you prioritize in your life? Being rooted and established in love has some incredible, practical outcomes in our lives. It brings spiritual maturity. And so to those of you who are just starting out in your journey with Christ, let me urge you just to lean in to the love of God. Be rooted and established in his love so that you can grow and bear fruit in love. And maybe you've been walking with God for a long time and you are still a spiritual infant, that you're looking at your life, I've got no growth in my life. I'm not loving God more. I'm not loving people more. Let me encourage you, be rooted and established in love. As you make yourself, put yourself in a place where you can experience yourself as the beloved, it will bear fruit and bring spiritual maturity in your life. It brings spiritual power. So for those of you who are feeling powerless, empty, directionless, let me pray for you that you might grasp together with all the saints how wide and how long and how high and deep God's love for you is because when we understand how loved we are, it brings spiritual power. It brings boldness. So for those of you who are feeling maybe weak in your faith, insecure, shy, ashamed of being a follower of Jesus, know that you are loved and nothing can change that. Let that love give you security and boldness to live out your faith. It brings spiritual perseverance. And so if you're feeling like like you're about ready to quit, that the pressure of this world or of this culture is making you want to just throw in the towel? No, you are loved. You are loved immeasurably. You are loved unconditionally, universally. You are loved radically, deeply, gracefully, eternally. Let that love change you. 
Let it sustain you. Be rooted in it. Be established in it. Let God's love for you be the foundation of your life. Let God's love for you be the foundation of your faith. Because nothing in all of heaven, nothing in earth, not a demon, not death, not height, nor depth, nothing in the present, nothing in the future will ever be able to separate you or me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our Father, reveal your love to us. May we be rooted in it. May we be established in it so that we could become who you've already said we are. In Jesus' name, amen.